Hello, my name is Alora Larson and I'm a museum educator at the National Museum of the United States Army. Welcome and thank you for joining us today for our virtual field trip, Defining American, Native Soldiers in World War I and the Path to Citizenship. As we're getting started, it is essential to note that there are currently 574 federally recognized tribes with many more recognized at the state and local levels and tribes still working on getting recognition. Indigenous cultures are expansive and diverse and just as equally so is their history. Native soldiers have served in almost every conflict in American history and frequently in large numbers. So why is that? Especially since they are fighting for a country that has a habit of breaking promises and oppressing Native populations. Today we'll be looking at Native soldiers during World War I as they fought for freedoms abroad as well as at home. Before we get into World War I, it is important to address the situation of Native American citizenship and status leading up towards the war. Let's start out by thinking, what is a citizen? A citizen is someone who is a recognized member of the town or country they live in. American citizens also have the right to vote in elections. The citizenship status of indigenous Americans is a complicated matter until the 20th century. Initially, natives were not considered American citizens for two reasons. They had their own tribal governments and they were not paying taxes to the federal government. Their tax status was due to Article I of the Constitution, which states representative and direct taxes shall be apportioned among several states which may be included within this union, according to their respective numbers and excluding Indians not taxed, three-fifths of all other persons. This act is famously referred to as the Three-Fifths Compromise, but it's also significant because it states that indigenous peoples would not be considered citizens under United States legislation. This changed in 1886 with the passing of the 14th Amendment, which states all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. While the amendment says that anyone born in the United States is a citizen, the application of this act was not applied to indigenous peoples. There was so much confusion about the status of native citizenship in the 14th Amendment that the Senate Judiciary Committee was called for a hearing in 1870. Their final ruling was that Native Americans were under the jurisdiction of the government, but the 14th Amendment to the Constitution had no effect whatsoever upon the status of Indian tribes within the limits of the United States. The 1850s began a new era in Indigenous American history. Following the removal of many tribes from their ancestral homelands, the government implemented the reservation system. Look at this map from 1888 and locate the reservation land that is highlighted in red. What is a reservation? Reservations are legally defined as land set aside for federally recognized tribes. Two of the main goals for the formation of the reservation system were to allow settlers to move west and to push native populations away from their traditional ways of life to what was deemed more American. This goal was never met, but the repercussions of the reservation era policy still remain to this day. The reservation system also challenged tribal governments' right to govern by giving Congress the right to take away their jurisdiction. Tribes living on reservations were watched over by government agents also known as Indian agents. Not all tribes were placed on reservations though. If tribes were not on reservation land, they would still be watched over by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, but did not have the same regulations as tribes on the reservations. Today, there are almost 52 million acres of land that make up the 326 federal reservations. On this map are some of the reservations like Navajo, Choctaw, Sioux, and Red Lake that were all established in 1888, still remaining today. Now here's a map of reservation lands from 2016. What are some of the similarities and differences that you can see between the two maps? The passing of the Dawes Act in 1887 allowed for the government to tighten its control on reservation lands. The Dawes Act was an act to provide for the allotment of lands in several T to Indians on the various reservations and to extend the protection of the laws of the United States and the territories over the Indians and for other purposes. The goal of this act was to push Native peoples to claim parts of reservation land with a promise of citizenship if they accepted. Through the Dawes Act, 60% of the estimated Native population became citizens. With that 60%, the ability to vote was never a promise. So while they were citizens by law, they were not afforded their full rights. By enacting the Dawes Act, the United States government was continuing to tighten its hold on the tribes and push them away from their traditions by enforcing ownership over a specific plot of land instead of communal ownership, which was a common practice in many nations. The division of reservation land also allowed for the government to reclaim reservation land and sell it to settlers who were consistently moving west. So what implications could this policy have on indigenous Americans? 
By the end of the 1880s, most Native peoples were relocated out of ancestral homeland and the government began implementing assimilation policies. So you may be thinking, what is assimilation? The goal of these policies was to bring Native populations into Anglo-American ideas and customs and erase their tribal tradition and identities. Let's take a closer look at the photo on the screen. These are two different photos of the same person. The image on the left shows Dine or Navajo student Tom Torlino at, before he went through the assimilation process, and on the right is him three years later. What are some of the differences you can see? As you can see in these photos, Torlino's physical appearance was altered to take away his native identity. The goal of assimilation was to push native peoples away from their cultures, starting with changes to their physical appearances as a way to make them look more European. So while the native populations were not considered American citizens, the United States government wanted them to look and act as such. The Bureau of Indian Affairs was in charge of reservations and therefore played an important role in the assimilation era. They were responsible for reservation land and served as liaisons from the tribe to the government. Their role expanded in this era to encourage assimilation process, which included enforcement of boarding school policy. In 1879, the first government-operated Indian boarding school opened up in the United States. Carlisle Indian Industrial School was opened in Carlisle, Pennsylvania by former Army General Richard Henry Pratt. Pratt's goal with the school can be summarized with his infamous quote, kill the Indian, save the man, which became the policy for all boarding schools that began to pop up across the country. By 1901, there were 25 non-reservation government-operated schools with 20,000 children in attendance. Nearly 83% of all indigenous school-aged children would have attended one of these schools at the time. The goal of these schools was to push for assimilation of the children by essentially stripping the students of their native identity and replacing it with an American one. Due to his military background, Pratt organized the schools with a military-like structure. When children first arrived, they were given a uniform and could not wear their traditional clothing. Hair, which was crucial in many native cultures as a way of expressing their identity, was cut to match European standards. The first photo you saw earlier of Tom Torlino was taken when he entered Carlisle, and the second photo was taken three years later to show the changes that the students went through. Living in former army barracks, students were divided into regiments, units, and battalions. They would even learn and practice military drills like you can see depicted in this photo taken at Carlisle that is currently on the screen. In a ways to continuously remove students from their native heritage, students were renamed with European names upon arrival. The goal of the lesson in the schools was to make the students ashamed of their native identity. Russell Bach Sr., a member of the Southern Ute tribe, said of his time at boarding school, we couldn't speak our language, we couldn't sing our prayer songs. To this day, maybe that's why I can't sing. Students were taught English, and if they were heard speaking their own native language, they were severely punished. Corporal punishment was common in these schools. The schools became a dangerous place quickly for students. Due to unsanitary conditions and overcrowding, disease ran rapidly through the schools, creating an environment that could be fatal. Despite the reality of the schools, the government considered them to be a success. In 1891, it became mandatory for children who lived on the reservation lands to attend a boarding school. If it was discovered that a child was not attending, the Bureau of Indian Affairs could withhold food or other resources from families, or in even some cases, forcibly take the child from their reservation. By 1925, the number of students in the 25 schools tripled to 60,889 in attendance. On the screen currently is a map of all the boarding schools. What do you notice about their locations? The boarding schools tended to be located close to some of the reservations, while others tended to be farther away from home, separating families even further. Now that we have gone over more about citizenship, American attitudes, and policies toward native tribes leading into World War I, let's talk about the idea of service. Indigenous people have a long history of military service leading up to World War I. In the American Revolution, many tribes tried to stay neutral, but a few tribes ended up fighting on the colonists' side. In the American Civil War, 3,503 indigenous soldiers fought for the Union Army to protect their lands and ways of life. After the Civil War, the Army authorized the enlistment of up to 1,000 indigenous men to serve as the scouts for the United States Army as they pushed west. Many of the scouts were familiar with the climate, terrain, and neighboring tribes which made them indispensable. Scouting was also believed to have a secret benefit. 
and encouraged the scouts to fight against neighboring tribes, which was seen as a way to potentially override any overall indigenous solidarity. Nantahe is a famous example of one of these scouts. One of 10 Apache scouts, Nantahe was awarded the Medal of Honor for his courage and bravery as a scout, which can be seen on display in the museum. Previous military service combined with intentional or unintentional racism contributed to a misperception that indigenous peoples have an inherent warrior ability. Has anyone heard of the warrior tradition before? And when you hear that phrase, what does it make you think of? The warrior tradition is something that the military has highlighted throughout American military history through recruitment posters, folklore, and other means of disseminating information. This holds true in World War I when all branches of the military were actively recruiting Native soldiers into their ranks and broadcasting their accomplishments. There has long been this idea that Indigenous peoples have an innate warrior ability which can make them great soldiers. The stereotype of the Native warrior can be traced back to the colonial era. Historian Tom Holmes said that creating this identity in America accomplished two things. First, it excused colonial army losses to native forces by claiming that the latter had demonstrated extraordinary savagery or ruthless martial skill. Second, it justified treating native peoples as less than human and unworthy of their lands. The effects of this stereotype can still be seen today. With the perception that indigenous people have a natural soldier skill, native soldiers are more frequently placed in riskier roles, units, and circumstances, which has led to a higher number of casualties. In World War I, indigenous soldiers had a mortality rate of 5% compared to the 1% of the rest of the American Expeditionary Forces. Traditionally in tribes with a warrior tradition, the role of the warrior tended to go beyond just military ability. In many nations, the warrior represents a person who worked to help their community at any cost. The National Museum of the American Indian says that the role of the warrior involved more than fighting. Warriors cared for families in need and helped during difficult times. They did anything to ensure their people's survival, including laying down their lives. Some native soldiers may view their service as a continuation of the warrior tradition, but it's important to note that indigenous cultures are not a monolith. The myth of the warrior simplifies the complex and diverse systems of native worldviews and cultures. So then why did native soldiers enlist in the army during World War I? Like all Americans, Native soldiers enlisted for many reasons. Many enlisted to secure employment, explore the world, or prove themselves. Some saw it as a way to get out of the reservation system. Others were inspired by President Woodrow Wilson's wartime stance to fight for the ultimate peace of the world and liberation of peoples, for the right of nations great and small, and for the privilege of men everywhere choosing their own way of life. In the words of Owen Hayes' hymn, Who is Cheyenne River Sioux, in a questionnaire, this world war in which I took part in is something that will be in my memory forever. I know I might get killed, yet I know I ought to do something for my country, as we Indians are the real Americans. Due to the military structure of the boarding schools, men who attended them were seen as more desirable to Army recruiters. Thomas Pickett of the Crow Nation was a bugler in the 35th Infantry Division said, It reminds me of school, only the drilling is longer, but I surely like it, and I'm going to stand by the flag as long as my feet will hold me. Students from boarding schools like Pickett volunteered in large numbers, so much so that the Bureau of Indian Affairs began noting school affiliation in their reference file. Carlisle Indian Industrial School alone had 205 former students serve. In the end, according to the Bureau of Indian Affairs, 17,313 Native American men registered for service. 12,000 ultimately served. In the Army, the 10,000 men who served were assigned to cavalry, medical, and signal units, as well as the military police, balloon squadrons, and the Aviation Corps. The 14 Native women who served were all in the newly established Army Nurse Corps. The United States officially entered World War I on April 6, 1917, around three years after the war began in Europe. Indigenous soldiers would end up seeing almost all major battles of World War I during the United States' involvement. While it seems overall that the Native reaction to World War I was one of protecting the country, it was not a universal feeling. Tribes like the Pueblo, Navajo, and parts of the Haudenosaunee or Iroquois objected to the required conscription because they did not want to fight for freedom when they were not given those same freedoms themselves. The Iroquois asserted their tribal sovereignty by saying that the United States had no right to declare war for them considering their status as non-citizens. The Oneida and the Onondaga, two tribes who were members of the Iroquois, worked around the stance by declaring war against Germany on their own. Indigenous Americans were considered non-citizens, which made them entitled to deferments, but were not given equally. 
off-reservation boards did not consistently approve deferments because there is no test to determine citizenship status. Only 228 men, 1% of all who registered, were able to claim deferment. Native soldiers were not placed in segregated units. Early in the war, there were some segregated native units, with the most well-known being Company E of the 142nd Infantry. But Pratt and the Bureau of Indian Affairs argued that the integration of native soldiers would help their assimilation process by wiping out instead of strengthening moral prejudice. Native soldiers served in a majority of battles that the Army engaged in. General John Pershing, commander of the American Expeditionary Force on the Western Front, said that the North American Indian took his place beside every other American in offering his life for the great cause. On the map on the screen, it shows all of the battles Native soldiers engaged in. Benjamin T. E. Prettyboy of the Sioux Nation highlighted his time in the Meuse-Argonne Offensive, the largest and final push that the Allied forces made leading to Germany's surrender. He said, the very one interest in my war experience I had in my mind and the biggest one is on the date of September 27th, 1918, when we started to open fire on the Hindenburg Line on Argonne Forest. We, the artillerymen, were catching hell during that drive. On the front lines, soldiers are placed in scouting or sniper roles under the belief that they would be more comfortable in these positions playing back on the misconception of the warrior. Louis Bighorn Elk of the Hunk Papa Sioux said about his service, I was overseas 15 months. I liked it all right. I was used well. Never had any trouble with officers. I fought in the trenches. I was not afraid. When asked if he was cited for bravery, he said no. The home folks cite us for bravery when we get back home. Native soldiers would end up taking on important roles not only in combat positions but in communication and nursing as well. At the point in which the United States entered the war, the boarding schools and the concept of kill the Indian, save the man had been around for almost 40 years. Despite this, the army decided to capitalize on the fact that many indigenous populations still spoke their native languages at home. And regardless of the punishment enforced if caught by school instructors, many boarding school students still remember their ancestral languages. Is anyone familiar with the term code talker? If not, what do you think it could possibly mean? If you are familiar with the term code talker, it's from the Navajo Marine Code Talkers of World War II. But in fact, it was the army that initiated the use of native languages as a code, specifically in World War I. Code talker became a nickname for native soldiers who were responsible in using their languages to send coded messages. American communication lines were easily being compromised by German forces and the army had to come up quickly with an alternative means of communication. Using native languages came about by accident. An officer overheard two native soldiers speaking what was to the officer an unfamiliar language. After talking with the two men, he decided that their language would work as a form of a code. During World War I, there are two primary documented tribes contributing their languages to the Allied cause. The Eastern Band Cherokee of North Carolina starting in early October 1918 and the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma beginning in late October 1918. The Eastern Band Cherokee used their language during the Somme Offensive, and the Choctaw soldiers used their language at the Meuse Argonne. These groups, who called themselves telephone squads, would use army telephones and radios to transmit messages, initially written in English in their native language. A native soldier on the other end would then translate the message back into English and pass it along to the proper channels. The term code talker didn't come around until World War II. It is important to note that there was never one designated code used by all native soldiers because there's no one indigenous language used by all tribes. Each tribe has its own language, and because of this, not all indigenous languages have an equivalent term or phrase for anglicized military words and terms. Native soldiers had to get creative when translating messages. For example, Choctaw soldiers equated grenades with a stone, regiment became tribe, casualties became scalps, and battalions were equated to grains of corn. For example, 2nd Battalion was called two grains of corn. By doing this with each individual indigenous language, native soldiers were able to create multiple codes within a code, thus making it that much harder for the enemy to try and decipher messages. The new method of communication baffled the German army, who up until that point had an easy time deciphering American code. In fact, a captured German officer once asked what new language the Americans were using to send their messages, and his captors humorously responded with, American. There is no record of American coded messages transmitted using native languages ever being broken. 
That is a feat in itself, but what this really highlights is the ability of indigenous languages to persevere through decades of blatant racism and forced assimilation policies. In an era where native men and women were raised to feel shame towards their heritage, it was in fact their culture that helped secure the final victory of World War I. Another important role that native soldiers took on was serving in the newly formed Army Nurse Corps. Despite racial prejudice, 14 native women served on the Army Nurse Corps as well as many others volunteering with the American Red Cross. Cora Elm was one of these 14 women. Elm was born in Wisconsin on the Oneida Reservation, where she lived until she was sent to the Carlisle Boarding School from 1906 to 1914. Interested in a career in nursing, Elm continued her studies in Pennsylvania at Episcopal Hospital School of Nursing in Philadelphia. After she graduated, she continued working at Episcopal Hospital as a supervisor until the outbreak of war. Elm enlisted on November 23, 1917. She began her time at Base Hospital 34 in France starting on December 14, 1917, where she stayed until the end of the war. Initially, the Army Nurse Corps only accepted U.S. citizens who were female, unmarried, between the ages of 25 and 35, Caucasian, and graduates of training schools, but these requirements loosened as the need for nurses increased. When asked about how she served in World War I, Elm said, I have been asked so many times by some of the Oneidas how I happened to join the Army Corps. I try and tell them that I could have not been admitted if I was not a graduate nurse, and then they would give me a surprise look and ask me when and where I trained. Due to Elm's time at Episcopal Hospital School, she was allowed to become an official member of the nursing corps. All overseas service was voluntary, which meant that Elm volunteered herself to serve at Base Hospital 34 for the duration of the war. Elm was honorably discharged on August 19, 1919. Reflecting on her time in the nurse corps, she said, life overseas was not very easy. Although I was in a base hospital, I saw a lot of the horrors of war. I nursed many a soldier with a leg cut off or an arm. This document that you can currently see on the screen tells us a little bit more about Cora's life. The document you see is her discharge paperwork. If you take a close look at the document, you can see some important things about Cora's life. What is the most interesting thing on there to you? The efforts of people like Cora Elm and other Native soldiers during World War I were not taken for granted, but Native servicemen and women still faced an uphill battle when returning home. As we mentioned earlier, even after the passing of the Dawes Act, about 40% of Indigenous Americans were not considered citizens. World War I ended on November 11, 1918. Over 1,250 Native soldiers had sacrificed their lives in service to the United States. And yet, when the remaining Native soldiers returned home, their status within the country that they had just risked their lives to defend remained unchanged. Indigenous tribes were still confined to reservations, and they were overseen by government and Indian agents. They still relied on the United States government for food rations, and many of them were not afforded the full rights of American citizens. It took a year before any legislation regarding citizenship for Native populations not affected by the Dawes Act was enacted, but even then, citizenship was selective and only granted to a few. On November 6, 1919, Congress passed H.R. 5007, also called an act granting citizenship to certain Indians. Now known as the Veteran Citizenship Act of 1919, this bill allowed for Native veterans of World War I to apply for citizenship with the understanding that their application would be granted. This bill only covered World War I veterans who had been honorably discharged from military service. In total, the bill only affected a few thousand men and it did nothing to help elevate their family and tribe citizenship standings. Following the passing of the Veteran Citizenship Act, the fight for citizenship still remained. Six years after the end of World War I, the Indian Citizenship Act was passed extending citizenship to all Native Americans in exchange for the right to tax them. The act read, all non-citizen Indians born within the territorial limits of the United States be and they are hereby declared citizens of the United States, provided that the granting of such citizenship shall not in any manner impair or otherwise affect the rights of any Indian to tribal or other property. So what did this mean for citizenship? Natives were considered to have dual citizenship, one to their tribal affiliation and one to the United States. But the fight for equal rights did not stop there. It is important to note that even though indigenous Americans were allowed to become citizens in 1924, they did not fully gain the right to vote until the passing of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. 
For 1965, it was up to the state if they allowed Native citizens to vote, and frequently they were denied. Since World War I, Native soldiers have continued to enlist in high numbers for Army service. To this day, Native servicemen and women serve at higher rates than any other demographic in the country. Kevin Gover of the Pawnee Nation and former director of the National Museum of the American Indian attributes this to they, the soldiers, are acknowledging the mistreatment their tribes have suffered at the hands of the United States and yet they still imagine a different and better tribal life in the future. Thank you for attending our virtual field trip today. If you want to learn more, please check out our website.